Good morning, St Luke's. One of the things that I like about the location of our vicarage is that I can sit in my study on the sofa and look out of the front window and see St Luke's Church sitting at peace in its patch of grass, maybe with a few people wandering around on the lawns. And as I've had a chance uh, maybe to look upon the church building a little bit more regularly, I've seen other wonderful viewpoints as well. One of my favourite being uh, when I'm able to be out in the garden in the early evening and the sun is shining and slowly it passes across the stained glass window that you can see behind me and the sun lights up the images from the outside rather than normally having to wait for the lights to be on inside. For all of the appreciation of the architecture of St Luke's uh, we can't ignore that in our reading this morning, in Acts chapter 7, Stephen declares these words, God does not live in houses made by men. We need to remember that the great tragedy of our church buildings being closed uh, over the last few weeks is that we cannot meet together. It is the absence of Christians being able to meet with each other, which is the great sadness rather than specifically the closure of our buildings. We've been looking over the last uh, few days at dangers or obstacles that can stand in the way of the flourishing of God's church. So the danger of chaotic uh, organisation and the danger of how we respond to opposition yesterday. And today, uh, the unashamed danger is that of an obsession over church buildings. Buildings are as much a potential obstacle to faith as opposition uh, and poor structure. We're going to see uh, in Acts chapter 7 uh, how uh, Stephen has been accused of two things in the preceding chapter. He's been accused of blasphemy against the words of Moses and also of how uh, he was seeking to destroy the temple and the customs of Moses. Both of these are at best exaggerations. Certainly Jesus himself taught uh, or tore apart the faithless legalism of first century Judaism and he made a focused critique on the life of the temple itself. It's likely that Stephen had maybe picked up on these teachings as the apostles did and so the criticism is an exaggeration of those things. So it was an easy accusation uh, for those that were accusing Stephen to make. The great problem of the time, you see, was that it had become, uh, or worship had become, concerned with rules and with rituals, rather than with having a true heart for God. Rules, rituals, buildings and practices. There was no real desire to worship and obey the Lord their God. And Stephen responds to these false accusations with a lengthy sermon. He gives a summary of the Old Testament patriarchs a focus on the history up to Moses, hardly the knowledge of somebody who was ignorant or twisting the words of Moses, hardly the background of a blasphemer. And Stephen points out that in that period, the Israelites continually turned away from God and pursued idolatry, rejecting the prophets that were sent to call them back. Stephen's accusers are guilty of the same offence, and he finishes with this cutting accusation in verse 52. Was there ever a prophet your fathers did not persecute? They even killed those who predicted the coming of the righteous one. And now you have betrayed and murdered him. Stephen isolates then their misunderstanding about where God resides as a cornerstone of their idolatry and rejection of him. He tells them that our God is the maker of heaven and earth. Heaven is his throne and the earth is his footstool. He doesn't need a mid 19th century, somewhat drafty rain shelter to inhabit. He's told us that now he dwells in his people by his spirit. And so when we reach the point of being able to re-enter our church building, we must ensure that our excitement is over meeting together and not the building itself. Stephen's critique was that an obsession over rules and rituals uh, that centred around a building, the temple in first century Jerusalem, and could so easily be our misplaced focus with our church buildings today, had left God's people hard-hearted and stiff-necked. 
Looking to the future, we must ensure that our buildings only hold value to the point that they show others the glory of God through Jesus Christ. And we must be ready to acknowledge when they become obstacles to us that cause us to be stiff-necked and hard-hearted. Let me pray for us. Loving Heavenly Father, we thank you that you dwell in us, your people, by your Spirit. That we do not need buildings to come into your presence, but you welcome us th uh, freely through the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ. Uh, therefore, Lord, forgive us for where we are hard-hearted or stiff-necked in all sorts of ways, but particularly in regard to an obsession over our buildings. And so may the future be one uh, where we as your people show your glory in the way that we live and worship. Amen.